Hello everybody, it's Classic David, we did another podcast with Curtis. Hello Curtis. Hi David. So I'm very happy to be here with you again and keep doing this podcast every other week on which we always uh, do lots of updates and plus we additionally talk about lots of interesting stuff. Today Curtis is going to talk about Tesla Palantir and he has a one a very interesting question he's gotten from Harvey. Hello Harvey. So yeah, Curtis is going to pay attention to that. And also then I am going to as well mention two, uh, two uh, altcoins that I want to mention. Briefly Luxo, I have one thing to say to you about Luxo and Ripple. I will talk about Ripple a little bit. So uh, let's start with updates. Um, Curtis, I think you usually start with a Bitcoin update. So would you like to go? Right. Okay. So we've had a sort of a fail on the upside. <laughs> Uh, the breakout kind of failed. Um, we were above the 45,500 level for about six days, I think there, which was looking good. It was somewhere between 46 and 47.5. And from a technical perspective, that was very bullish. Um, a lot of analysts had the 45.5 as the necessary support level to sort of keep the trend up. Um, so we pulled back below the 45.5. We're at the 42 now. Um, doesn't mean we're not moving higher. It just means that that small technical analysis kind of failed there. So we'll see what happens. It looks like it's still forming this sort of uh, bull or bear pennant. Anyways, a pennant shape is still forming um, somewhere between the lows at 32 and the highs at I guess it's around the 45 now or the 46. So. Um, it looks like we're going to go into kind of a point at the pennant and then we'll either break up or break down probably mid-May. So now my turn. So uh, I've gotten the pullback, so, but it perfectly touched my red line. I made this red line last, uh, last uh, two weeks ago, I believe. But it doesn't mean that it's the ultimate support that we can go lower. Or it doesn't mean that can be, I can't be wrong. I talked yesterday about this red line here, this red line moving average. It's 20 week moving average. I made a short video yesterday. Week. Yeah, it, I made a uh, yesterday's uh, short video about uh, talking about it a little bit that it's actually called a bull market support band. Lots of analysts, even like uh, uh, Kraken Intelligence as well. Lots of many people, many, uh, many. 2021 uh, week is good, yeah. I uh, and uh, also then there is one more uh, one more moving average that also forms a bull market support band, but I don't do not use that one. I think it's less significant. Anyway, I talked yesterday about the how significant it is, and we have actually closed weekly below that, and uh, that uh, is going to be in the eyes of everybody extremely bearish. Right. So if I had to like, yeah, I, I have to admit that from the technical perspective, it looks really bad. It looks really bearish. Uh, Just like from technical perspective, it looked absolutely brilliantly excellent when we broke new all-time high and made mm -hmm. weekly close, uh, weekly close about that. Mm -hmm. And so, if I was so, I acknowledge that it is uh, technically it looks pretty dark, bearish. I mean, but at the same time, if I was a director of the markets, like uh, from behind the stage, if I was directing everything myself, I would actually do this just to fool everybody and now just right. to let all the influencers speak how bearish it is. And right. people are selling at the moment. People are shorting at the moment. We are at 0% funding rate. People are shorting. We are back in, uh, in fears. Right. So this is exactly what I would put the market into and people are selling at the moment. And now what I would do if I was directing the markets, I would actually move us upwards somewhere around the year. To this mm, yeah, that seems like that would be the surprise move. Yeah. What's to the blue plastic. line, by the way? What's the light blue uh, line? That's blue also line. my line. This one. Oh, no, the light blue. One. Oh, okay. This is a moving average. Uh, this is a 50 day moving average. 50 day moving average also plays significant. 50 day or 50? 50 day. And the other one is 20 week. And this is a 20 week. Yes. Okay. And I have one more that I'm looking at, and that is 20 month moving average. Okay. And, uh, but again, moving averages are, are indicator and also I have 
noticed in the past that it takes a long time before you really learn to master an indicator to the point that you are profitable from it. So that's why it is, in my opinion, highly advisable not to use indicators at all. Maybe volume. Volume is one of the most essential ones. And if you are using indicators, just give yourself time to learn, like one by one, and be patient. Like these things can years take years. This is the extremely competitive environment. This is one trillion dollar, well, two trillion dollar market. It's a it's extremely right. competitive. So give yourself time. Right. As for Bitcoin, anyway. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Lie. Okay. Um. Mm, I think that we also said that we should do. Ethereum very briefly, maybe every time, as the biggest altcoin and perhaps the king of all altcoins so far. Still, <clears throat> so as for the Ethereum, uh, Ethereum has not yet even tested fifty days, so maybe it's gonna test it. I don't know. Right. Fifty day moving average, it will be three k, and that mm -hmm. would also align perfectly with this uh, with this swing point. So, of course, there is. Still not not uh, announcement date of the uh, merge. <laughs> not to my knowledge. Yeah. So right. people are in expectations. So I think it's, yeah. it's more bullish than Bitcoin. So what next, gold? Sure. That's also slow chart, so we can just fly through it. Do you want to say anything? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, just not moving much. Like I said, it's a slow chart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks pretty good can overall. It looks pretty good. I mean, it's holding. The 1900 level for on is daily it, what, is that week is that daily yeah this so, is daily yeah this actually i think that looks pretty bullish i'm even surprised oh yeah i can yeah, see now support. i can so see now why support. yeah yeah it's pretty bullish there is more to the left side okay there's yeah. a cluster it's just like just how much return are you going to get though right are you going to get 20 percent this year on gold maybe you get 20 percent upside from january to december i would uh this year in 2022 right i'm just saying yeah i mean what's your upside like let's say it breaks out you're gonna uh -huh. get it to you know 20 2200 2300 so what is that that's is that 15 percent that's about a 15 percent gain i would that's generally not, not agree bad. that I, bad, I think but... it's realistic as well yeah but i would still not uh buy i would Again, this red line, I drew it like two podcasts ago. This is a slow chart. It's going to take a while before this red line is hit, 1830. Mm. But once it is hit, then I will seriously think, I will first time in my life buy a little bit of the gold. Right. Anyway, uh, that was for the gold. Now US dollar. Would you like mm -hmm. to say something? I hit your 100. So nice round number. Uh-huh. hit 100. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, 0 .03 yeah, it continues. Even. It look at, if you look at uh, US dollar yen, it's a good one to watch because again, yen was historically the flight to safety even more so than the US dollar, but that no longer seems true. So look at what we're doing there. Wow. It's so 125 dollars. Yen. We'll look back for $1. when the last time it was at 125. How long ago? If you look back. I have to go to monthly. Oh, not, oh, okay. Wow. So yeah, four, five, six years 2015, ago. 2015, 2015. That's very significant. And look at the, and then look at, it's a high, I mean, even 2008, 2007, it was, a, so it's really, it hasn't hit these levels for a long time. No, no, it hasn't, but it's not, I don't so, think it's going to go that much higher. No. Well, it could. I mean, again, the, the reason is because of the Fed bullishness or sorry, the Fed hawkishness on rates and Japan's flat. So as rates go up, as people start offering more money on U.S. treasuries, investors will buy U.S. dollars and sell yen. Right? That's why it's going up. So unless the Japanese government decides to start um, getting tighter, which they won't, I don't think. Um, this trend should continue. Uh, and it, yeah, it also it is significant because a lot of people hold yen, so it's it's a it's a major currency. This is not talking about uh, the Canadian dollar or New Zealand or something. The the U.S. dollar yen trade is mm -hmm. is a major it's a major major global. There's a lot of money there. So, um, but um, yeah, the chart looks like it would probably correct, but. Um, Maybe they've now um, baked in all of the 
like someone who's been selling the yen might think, okay, it's over now. We we, we understand the U.S. rates are going to go to two percent, but but if you saw more hawkishness from from Powell, you would then um, see this continue. Well, I am going to say that this would be my target as the right. top, and it's never, in my opinion, it will not. I mean, never say never. Well, look further back. But... Look at look at um, two thousand two thousand two. What did it hit? One forty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so the, the chart says you're, you know, it's not going to go that much higher, I guess. Uh huh. Uh, but but um, we may be in new territory here. But um... well, I'm gonna switch back anyway. to the U.S. dollar index because sure. the U.S. dollar index is now approaching my target as well. It aligns. Right. Yeah. It aligns, and in my opinion. This is as high as US dollar will ever get. I think US dollar will start falling. There's ever going is a to long be time. there is going to be bounce. But I think that in my opinion, once this blue line is hit, which is going to be soon, mm. we will never see in our podcast a higher US dollar index, in my opinion. Never say never, right? So I just said it. I just said right. it. I'm guilty. Again, you're looking at I'm it purely sorry. technically, which, which is your prerogative, like to look at it purely technically. But I, just my my opinion is you need to balance that with what's happening in macro because um, yes, know, the, mar the markets don't they care about charts as traders. They they don't care about charts when we're talking about other other uh, momentum's and events. Yes, right. Yes, and they I align. Yes, and I aligned it with my fundamental perspective. And my fundamental perspective is that what is going to follow soon is going to be all of this. What is the situation that happened is going to strengthen Russia and the ruble and it's going to make dollar fall and actually even lose the status as a reserve currency this decade. That's my fundamental perspective. Whole new world order is going to be shuffled. Right. Again, it has to be, has to, but DXY is against what? So the ruble's not becoming uh, the world currency, right? So, and remember last time we talked about what is in the DXY, we could just do a reminder on that, but the DXY is definitionally, it's against what? So even if the US dollar was not a reserve currency, you still need to say, what is it? Is the US dollar gonna weaken against? I don't um, know what is going to become the next to, uh, yeah. reserve so currency. We, I don't know. Because even if, let's say, a crypto, you don't like Bitcoin so much, but let's just say Bitcoin did become the reserve currency, the DXY would not measure Bitcoin at all. It would still measure US dollar versus the, the other basket because that's how it's measured. So this is a DXY chart. So um, let me just yeah, remind so myself on this. So what are the DXY currencies again? It's the yen, the British pound, mm -hmm. the Canadian dollar, the Swedish krona, and the Swiss franc. That's it. Mm -hmm. So so unless you're saying one of these other currencies is going to be more dominant than the US dollar, um, you're not really going to see. Uh, I think yen is going to go up. Well, OK, so and that's a theory. Oh, you. euros in there too, but right. So if you want to hear of a weak economy or a weak uh, currency base, it's the, the yen, right? We've been bankrupt for 30 years. And that's but, why um, that's exactly why I would call yen. That it they, will go up. Need... Mm. Anyway, this is already just too big call that I've just made. So I don't mm. know, and I, I don't know which one of these currencies is going to be strengthening, or if maybe all of them, the US dollar will be weakening. That that is just too specific. Like right. it would be just too too big to be trying to call even that. So right. let's see what happens. Uh, sure. Let's see what happens. We will short term, have we a look every other week because in the very short term, US dollar strength is coming from the Fed. Very soon, they'll, they'll, you know, it'll be all baked in, and we might, the market will say, okay, you, ten-year treasuries are going to two and a half percent, for example, and then you would have a correction down in this chart. It may show you a correction down. Longer term, I just don't see any of those other currencies um, competing with the U.S. dollar that well. Um, always could be wrong. Even the Swiss franc. The thing is, it's a weighted basket. So even if you say, okay, well, the Swiss franc is going to outperform or the Japanese yen is going to perform, but those are not weighted 100% within the basket, right? That's so, true. yeah, so um, it's not like it's Swiss franc versus US dollar exclusively. The DXY is US dollar versus all of those other currencies. Um, yeah. And the Swedish krona is not becoming the world currency. <laughs>
So this is also a slow chart, so it's going to take for this for my call to come true. If it comes true, it's gonna take us a long time. So we're talking years. So it's a long time, and yeah. that's why I think it is even impossible today to see the fundamental reasoning why it is going to happen. It's just that guts, you know, guts can tell you something actually there. Would okay. have been telling me. But anyway, we're gonna have a look every other week. We have not yet hit my blue line, but it's pretty interesting that the, I had this red line and blue line for a long time here. And first we crossed the red line. We were first here. No, no, actually. Yeah, when we started our podcast, we were here. Then we crossed right. it. Then we held it as a support. <laughs> Look at this touches. <laughs> exactly my line. And mm -hmm. now we're actually moving. So it can happen that my blue line will. And it's not going to even stay long on a blue line, in my opinion. Anyway. Okay. Uh, S&P 500, would you like to say something? Mm, this is weekly. Really. Let me search daily. Yeah. So the big, okay, yeah. the big debate, if you follow Tom Lee from Fundstrat, I recommend him to any of your listeners that are interested in, in US markets. He also covers crypto a little bit, but uh, Tom Lee, Fundstrat, um, he's the guy I often go to when I'm trying to get some perspective and he's a bit of a contrarian he tends to be he's quite bullish typically but um he's uh, his uh success rate on his calls is far better than most of the cnbc mm. contributors um so anyways he's he still thinks the low is the, that four thousand level you can see the the low the green wick there at 4120 or whatever mm -hmm. at the bottom he thinks that's the low for this year and um we're gonna somehow find a new bottom and then go higher Mm -hmm. um, he's even talked about new all-time highs later this year. Um, so whether he's right, I would say he's uh, uh, a contrarian. Uh, most of, of the CNBC commentators think we're going to test another low, so more like uh -huh. the four thousand range. So people are um, bench. So uh, yeah, I, I, Tom Lee's he, Tom Lee typically proves those guys wrong. He's mm. he's right more than he's right about seventy-five percent of the time, from from what I know, and he tends to be bullish. Um, but um, I guess that's where are, are we going to are we going to test the lows again, or you know is this just a higher low at you know forty four and we'll, we'll go up higher? But um, uh, this week I guess the Fed I, I didn't hear what they said, but they were a little bit more hawkish and they surprised the market a bit, so we had to sell off. Mm -hmm. I have just turned on the fifty day moving average because as you can see it plays significance in S P. Yeah. Just look yeah. at all of this. Just look at that. Yeah, yeah. There was one uh, um breakdown. But uh yeah, That's for the I last think two, year and a half. Yeah. Two years. I think even for me, uh S P five hundred is slightly less predict less harder to predict than crypto. Uh also well, let me see when we did the last podcast. It was 28th of March. Where were we? Oh, we were actually here. So we pulled right. back as well. Ever yeah. since that time, in my opinion, that we actually closed two dailies above that. Let me see the weekly. And weekly is just even better. To be honest. Um, this full bug is in for this cluster. I mean, this is another significant level, but that would be below 50 day. To be honest, for me, I think that we may actually now retest the all time high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that if I was a, if I was the orchestrating the markets, if I was directing the markets, that's what I would do. It's yeah, a well, the wars, significant the wars, cluster. Oh yeah, the situation. You. It's pulled back, right? They've sort of with they didn't attack Kiev, which surprised no, a lot of people. No, they didn't. It looks it like looks like the yeah. head fake idea was right. The idea that Kiev, well, it could have been they tr they wanted to take Kiev and they just failed. And and that what CNN is saying is that they, you know, the Ukrainians kind of beat them in some level. The other theory is that they act that was their plan all along. They wanted to take that corridor from Crimea up to the mm -hmm. Donbass region, and, and Kiev draw was a head the fake. forces. Yeah, yeah, it was just draw that, so force. draw the attention yeah, draw, elsewhere. Yes. That's yes. that's what every military commando would actually. That's the plan that every military commando yeah. would would draw. Yeah. That yeah, draw the else the jab and then, fake. Yeah. Draw yeah. the forces uh, also. So um, and that makes sense. Uh, so it looks like they're going to take the Donbass region, 
and sort of a little bit more land to the south there on the Black Sea. The Luhansk and, as well. And uh, it make, that makes sense to me because that keeps Ukraine as a bit of a buffer without completely having to murder uh -huh. hundreds of thousands of people. So it kind of makes sense. And also in Luhansk and Donetsk, there kind of was a war for the past eight years. I have been yeah. all, you know, so the war was there for a long time actually now. So that just doesn't come as a surprise. And all of this that was happening, that the military infrastructure of, of Ukraine was destroyed, like uh, their warehouses, the storages, like like so many, like hundreds and hundreds of targets over the past month. Right. So right. it does look like that was the plan all along. And right. it's just as, as you said, but uh, Luhansk and Donetsk, it's not that much more fighting there as well. So in a reasonable time frame, like I would be, I'm going to bring a champagne if the next few weeks when we do another podcast, if the, if there is like, a, uh, there, if there are, you know, news that, uh, the piece is, is, is going to happen. Like the yeah. fighting is going to stop on 25th Hopefully. of March. If that's going to be the case, I'm going to bring a champagne here. Okay. Drink with you. Hope you will join one. Me. Yeah, we'll have to buy the same type. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yes, yeah, so that would be for S and P five hundred. So is there any more uh, any more updates that we want to do? There are Not, ex uh, some uh, extremely very slow charts like uh, dominance Bitcoin dominance, but we we discussed it that we are going to have a look at like every every couple of months. Bitcoin dominance is just the slowest of all slow charts. So. Okay, one quick follow up would be if you go to Teladoc, TDOC, we talked about Teladoc two weeks uh -huh. ago. Um, so it got cheaper even more. <laughs> it got cheaper again. So it's now below that mm -hmm. 70 mark. Look at it. But it's still holding the low, the low. I know, level. but I'm just saying, I was uh -huh. already thinking it's a good buy at 70. And I thought if it, if, definitely if it gets back down to 50, it's, it's at the bottom again. And it's uh, amazing. Um, but, tech stocks are still under pressure. They're still mm -hmm. haven't bounced really. So um, it, again, not financial advice, but uh, in the 50 to 55 to 60 range, it's really hard to, to think why you wouldn't buy that. It does look like, and it's, yeah, we discussed it the last podcast. Uh, have a look and see that I leave time stamps on the podcast. So you don't have to listen the whole hour and look for the information. Just click on the... Yeah. You know timeline what exactly which in fresh which information interests you but this is the info this is the company that has a uh, profits that you no know, makes money so mm -hmm. it doesn't make clear we've discussed it in the past uh yeah podcast I mean, that it's not justified about... that it's not minus 78 percent it's not really justified right, right. I mean, people are saying, OK, Precious. Bitcoin or Ethereum are going to triple, right? Bitcoin will go to 150,000 and Ethereum will go to 10,000. And that would be a 2x upside from here. But maybe Teladoc's a better a better bet, <laughs> right? It might it might get a 2x. I agree it's on this one. Same. I agree yeah. on this one. Yeah, I, I mean, am not it, it, convinced it, it, Bitcoin will ever reach even 100K if I. Yeah, anyway, anyway, uh -huh. I'll continue. Yeah, so I'll try to go fast. Let's start with Palantir. So this is our uh, okay, two weeks ago. We talked about we talked about what did we talk about? Zoom and Teladoc. Mm -hmm. And was it what else? Amazon? Yeah, no, I, no, no, no. I believe these two. Just those two. Okay, so Palantir Technologies. Um, I don't own it. Um, it's Peter Thiel, the guy from uh, PayPal and the big Bitcoin guy. Peter Thiel is one of the founders. Palantir is not a company I know that well, but I did some research because it was requested from one of our listeners. So. They are a data. Um, if you go to the shared folder that I sent you, something, David, it, there's a website there. It's a black. It's the last one I sent you on on Discord. Last one. Okay, their official website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I uh, just okay. introduced the company. It's 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 uh, data software. So you know they help you process data strategically. So it's it's business intelligence software. They have a few different suites. Um, there's, they have clients in the military, they have clients in security, they have clients in retail. Um, they crunch large amounts of data for clients. Um, so you could call it uh, business intelligence software, but I think it's sort of a, a, a version 2.0 of that. It's much more complicated. Uh, so deep, what they call deep data, 
So one example they give is you just give someone a, you give their their name and their company name, their personal name, their company name, and they can find everything you want to know about that guy. So um, they can they can take small pieces of data and gather large amounts of data and make it a strategic analysis of it. Okay. Um, so. But that's dangerous that's, that a centralized entity has this power, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, I can mean, be used against us. I'm sure. It oh, is. absolutely, sure. No, they have definitely they have military applications. They have government applications, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's what they do. They do. Uh, if you go to the slide, uh, okay. The next one would be the the purple. Their growth. So they're they're growing. This is their five year chart. Mm -hmm. um, this is revenue. Revenue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so pretty good. Uh, you can see the trend is up. Um, it's not exactly parabolic, but very steady, strong growth. Mm -hmm. um, when we looked at Zoom and Teladoc, we said that those companies were both clearly market leaders. And obviously Tesla falls into that. I'll talk about Tesla in a bit. Mm -hmm. I think Palantir a little bit less so. I mean, clearly they're, they're winning a lot of market share, but I think there are a lot of competitors in the space. So in a sense, they're not the clear winner, quote unquote, uh, and yet uh, they're doing well. Um, they're not profitable, uh, but they do a lot of stock uh, shares to their staff. So the 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 the, the internal staff are becoming very rich, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. but they're not declaring profits, which could be a strategy. I mean, Amazon did this for years and still does that, right? They just mm -hmm. pay they pay their staff in stocks. Everyone gets rich within the company, and then they run uh, the company profits at zero, right? So really, you want to look at growth more than, than profitability because they're not showing any profits yet. But that doesn't mean they're not a good investment. Um, at some point, they'll pivot away from that probably and, and start actually uh, taking profits to the, to the bottom line, so to speak. Um, so that's them. Um, you can go to their stock chart. Uh, so it looked very recently, they were as high as $35, $37 in January, 2021, or it looks like maybe February, March, 2021. Mm -hmm. And now they're down to 12 bucks. So what, it's about a 60% sell off? Over 60%, yeah, out of my top of my head. Um, and uh, I don't know, Peter Thiel's a very smart guy. I'm sure they'll do well. It's probably a good buy here. I don't know. I don't feel so strongly about this company, but um, okay. they're doing well. And let's go to Tesla. So this is uh, yeah. So Tesla. Okay. So everybody talks about it. Uh, I've owned Tesla since 2019. I still own oh. a lot of Tesla. So I did well. I got a tip from a guy named Mark Demessel that we know, and and I will forever owe him uh, a big thank you. That was a uh, big I, Mark's victory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, if you know, if, uh, so Tesla. What? Well, we'll get there. Okay. So Tesla is obviously known as an, the uh, market leader for electric vehicles. You can see here um, the global market 2021 uh, main producers. They have 13.8 percent of the market. It seems weird to me. It seemed like it was higher than that. But um, in any case, this is the data. Uh, but they're clearly the market leader. Um, they're, they're a leader, not just by sales, they're a leader by technology, they're a leader by innovation, they're a leader by growth, they're a leader by exponential growth of revenue and sales. Um, so, and I think that's going to continue. Um, there was a lot of news about like FUD or, you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt that, you know, once v uh, VW gets in or once BMW gets in or what, once Toyota gets in, they're going to catch up with the EV market. It's just not going to happen. Um, anyone that's really looked at deeply at, at the, the company uh, understands that they really don't have competitors um, at the moment. That may change, um, and they're they're growing leaps and bounds. So um, let's go to the next slide. It's got uh, three charts on it. Sales uh, the, growth. Yeah, this one, yeah, great. So sales growth. Um, what? Wow. So. Yeah, so I mean it's 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 exponential mm -hmm. compound, what 30, 40 percent a year for many years. Um, from about 2014 to 2019, the Tesla share price for five years was between something like it's I think like it was 19. 200 
$200 to $500 up and down for five years. And the reason was they hadn't really produced a lot of cars and they hadn't made a lot of money. So they were, mm -hmm. they were breaking even for about five years. And the FUD was that they're going to go bankrupt. They're going to run out of money. Yeah. They can't build profitable cars. They'll never make a profit. And that went on for about five years. Finally, those uh, FUD, FUD people were proven wrong. Uh, Tesla started to make money and their production started rising very quickly. And that's why the stock broke out. It's up about 25X from 2019. I think the low was about $200, but that was pre-stock split. And so now it's at 1,000 after a five to one stock split. So anyways, it's up about 25X. It's done way better than any crypto I know. I mean, the top ones, it's done way better than, than uh, Bitcoin for sure. Mm -hmm. been up since 2019 and it's outperformed ethereum as well mm -hmm. um so it, it was the big winner in the last couple of years um after a five-year wait though so patience pays off so um what else can i say in this chart not a lot just you can see the growth um if you go to let's talk about tesla so let's talk about rather than it being a hype stock let's talk about actually what is happening mm -hmm. um if you go to the chart that talks about their business Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's not just a car company. And that's the biggest thing people need to understand. Um, a lot of the critics say, well, you know, they're going to have to sell like 20 million cars a year to justify the price that they have right now, right? And it's just ridiculous because anyone that looks at it, the company for more than five minutes, I mean, go on YouTube for five minutes and you'll hear that it's not just an electric vehicles car, so a uh, company, right? So um, they will continue to, to grow their their car sales, of course, and it'll grow exponentially as they bring on uh, factories in Texas, factories in Berlin. They're going to mm -hmm. build another factory in, in China. They've already got one in, I believe it's in Shanghai. So they'll have a second one in China and that's going to keep going. Uh, but they also have the real sort of um, un, unmeasured profitability would come from autonomous network. Mm -hmm. So self-driving, if they ever really do master self-driving and make it use, uh, make it viable for the retail market, you'll see, a, you could see the stock double within 12 months from that breakthrough. There's some questions whether they'll actually be able to do it, but they're getting darn close. Um, and, you know, kind of everything Elon Musk has said, he's, he's delivered on. It just takes some, a little bit longer sometimes than what he promises, but um, self-driving would allow a lot, I mean, it would allow robo fleets of cars that actually mm -hmm. can drive taxis without drivers. That's um, already, uh, by the way, happening. It's already, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen people yeah, using yeah. the robo taxis already. Yeah, yeah. so it's there. Um, the story uh, Elon Musk told a few years ago, he said, you know, you'll be able to buy a, Teslas, a Tesla and go to sleep at night, turn it on, it'll go out and, and drive people around and earn you money while you're sleeping. No, whether that happens or not, I don't know. But it could be that uh, owning a Tesla is actually a mini business cash flow generator okay. for people. Now, who knows? Again, mm -hmm. he's made a lot of claims, uh, both with Tesla and SpaceX that have come true and people said it wouldn't. So uh, anyways, they're way ahead in autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of their business is battery. So they're getting way ahead in, in battery technology. They'll be able to license battery technology to other EV producers. So you'll see them get ahead with more than just the EV cars. Um, solar panels is another area. Um, we've seen Tesla demonstrate mini houses that you can buy for about 20,000 US dollars. Um, little like a box, like a, almost they look like cargo storage boxes, uh, but they're high tech little houses. So uh, they, they'll likely get into helicopters, uh, jet skis, a lot of other stuff. So mm -hmm. kind of the sky's the limit. I'm very bullish. Um, the, the stock is very expensive now. If you only see it, that they're only going to make cars and they're not going to pull away on these other technologies. But if you include autonomous driving, battery technology, solar technology, and everything else coming out, um, I think it's going to be the most valuable company in the world. I think it'll probably hit three or $4 trillion in 10 years. Um, Apple right now is at 2.78 trillion and, and Tesla's at, at 1 trillion, but I could easily see Tesla passing Apple. I think if you look at this page here, they're, they're solving more problems than Apple. Um, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and these are massive addressable markets, right? Mm -hmm. 
So, so uh, they could the stock's at a trillion now, uh, or the, the, the market cap. Uh, so that's about a thousand dollars per share. Um, I think it could easily go to three to five trillion, uh, another three to five x, maybe ten in ten years. Um, but that's not guaranteed. That's financial advice. Um, I think there's one more slide here. Um, Two vertical uh, so integration. Again, uh, this is what people don't get: is that they're similar to Apple, whereas Apple makes the hardware and the software, right? It's mm -hmm. vertically integrated. Okay, well, Tesla's also vertically integrated. The batteries they use, they make, right? Mm -hmm. The 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 uh, a famous quote from from Elon Musk is the best part in a car is to not have a part at all. In other words, he's trying to reduce parts uh, <laughs> within within the cars, and they have these. They have these uh, presses. They're big presses that basically will produce, let's say, the back end of the car. Rather mm -hmm. than having 12, 12 to 100 parts, they just make one molded piece. <laughs> they have special technology. You know what Whereas, it reminds me? Yeah. It reminds me of the Russian T-34s in the Second World War. One of the, you know, the tank that won the war, by the way. Right. I have heard and of they it. Made, yeah. They made it out of a single part of a steel, the, the Russians. Right. And that's it, that right. it was the contrarian to Germans that made their complicated high-tech tanks. And having one part on the tanks made it harder to to crack its, its oh, yeah, shell, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And it, and it, uh, was, it didn't break yeah. down as much as well. It worked right. always, you know. So um, what this graph is showing is the vertical integration of of every everything. Another thing here is the direct distribution model. And I could talk for hours about this. But what this means is basically every other car has a every other car company is selling through a dealer model, right? So you go to the, the dealership and there's a sales guy that's selling you a Toyota or selling you a VW, right? Um, that model is not, te Tesla is a direct to consumer model. So you, you go to a Tesla shop, not to buy the car, just to look at the cars, you order online and the car is delivered to you. So they completely cut out the um, dealership model, right? And that's a, a cost savings. Um, they're, the Tesla gigafactories are becoming higher and higher tech, and they're just outcompeting the legacy automakers. It's just it's just not a comparison. Anyone that looked at looked at this even even five years ago could have seen that they're just night and day. Hmm. Um, the ICE right the in, uh, what's uh, ICE stands for internal combustion engine right. If you have factories like that, they're useless as EV factories right you can't make an ev with an ice factory you have to refit it you have to rehire engineers you have to retrain everyone and transition so that ice factory is actually a liability you have all these staff you have to fire or retrain you have infrastructure and land that has to be repurposed and you have fact you have you know you have um factory floors that have been there for 50 years that are completely useless in terms of producing ev so they're really playing catch up, but they can't really catch up at this at this at this time. Um, mm -hmm. So they'll end up buying batteries off of Tesla. I think they'll end up buying technology off of Tesla. That's what these companies will have to do to chase them. will have to be, almost be a customer of theirs. Um, so I could go on and on. I think it's a good buy. Oh, there's one more thing is the idea that Tesla could be selling insurance. So mm -hmm. basically, they uh, it's not a car company. It's it's a computer on wheels, right? In the same way that, um, you know, like they're selling the software, they're selling mm -hmm. the AI technology, they're selling the upgrades, the entertainment systems, they're selling, uh, they'll be selling insurance connected to your profile within the company, sorry, within the Tesla ecosystem will be your profile and how you drive, how safely you drive. They will have all that AI data on you and they will know how, how to sell you insurance as cheaply as possible. So they'll probably start taking over car insurance as well. Um, okay. Anyways, I could go on. I'm not an expert. I could go on. Here's the stock price. It's very expensive historically, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's still a good buy. Um, it was at like $700 a month ago, $750. That was a good buy. Um, not financial advice. I think it's going to be a, a 2 to $3 trillion dollars in the reasonably near future, a couple of years. And so that's a doubling or tripling of, of what we see here. Um, they're going to do a stock split this year as well. 
I mean, that doesn't necessarily push the price uh, in the long mm -hmm. term, but um, uh, it, it makes it, the, the, the stock becomes cheaper for, for retail investors to buy. Okay. Uh, anyways, I'm a bull on this. Yeah. Okay. And now to the question from Harvey. Oh, do you want to do that? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, right. Okay. How much time do I have? Uh, how much time do you need? Five minutes, six minutes, seven. Okay. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> that's hilarious. To answer this question in six months, six minutes is impossible, but. Um, so let's go to the one that says the Roaring Twenties, because that was the question. The okay. slide that says Roaring Twenties. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was for, from one of our loyal listeners, Harvey. Um, he asked about uh, whether I thought the years 22 to 2030 would be similar to the Roaring Twenties, which were 1920 to 1929. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge question. I'll have to say I can't answer the question. I mean, uh, of course, I can try and I can give um, um, commentary on this, but no one can predict that. Also, it's very difficult to compare something that happened from 1920 to 1929 mm -hmm. to something happening almost 100 years later, because it's just obviously apples and oranges. It, it, there's different. Um, it's a different economy. It's a different world geo, you know, geo, uh, mm. yeah. geopolitical. Uh, events are different. Um, the populace is different. Technology is different. But but I'll give it a shot. I'll, I'll try to throw five minutes here just to see if it's useful. Um, but I guess first we need to identify what he was talking about. So in the U this is the U.S. economy from 1920 to 1929. The Dow rose 500% from the bottom of the depression. So there was a, a depression 1920 to 1921. Out of that, mm -hmm. it rose 500%. This is, I suppose, this is stock prices, right? The Dow. Yeah. Uh, before that, you had World War One, 1914 to 1918. You had the Spanish flu, 1918 to 1919, and then the Depression. Um, so uh, a little bit of digging. Um, if you go to that link uh, underneath that, the Roaring Twenties, there's a, a, a web link. Okay, I have a that? look. Let me have a look. Mm, All right, sorry. I see. It's on BBC. So if anyone's interested, they can read about it. Um, what I sort of pulled out of this article was, um, the, so the reasons uh, for the growth, it was it was technology. Um, if you scroll down a bit, um, well, there's a few factors, but one of them was uh, a lot of breakthroughs in technology. So they talk about the, the, the assembly line as a concept, uh, the, the Ford Motor Company. Um, as technology grows, unlocks the ability to use natural resources. So obviously natural mm -hmm. resources are not useful just sitting in the ground. You need technologies and products that make those valuable, right? So as the technology grows, you'll find uh, valuable resources just literally sitting in the ground that are then leverageable, which cause further uh, exponential value within the, the supply chain and the efficiency of the growth of the technology, right? So um, anyone that wants to read more and more about this uh, they can do a much better job than I can. Um, comparing that to now, so if we look at um, uh, comparing that to could that happen again from, from 2022 to 2030, I have no idea. No one knows that. Um, no one is able to analyze um, world events at that level. But what you can do, especially over a specific time frame, so saying, do I think X is going to happen from 2022 to 2030 is much more difficult than saying, giving myself another 10 years. So from 2020 to 2040, you've got an extra 10 years there. It's obviously much easier to make um, predictions. The, the shorter the time frame, it renders it increasingly impossible to make accurate predictions, right? Same with crypto, by the way. But, um, but what I thought, just to take a stab at it, would be looking at GDP and just the general growth of the world and the growth of technology. And I think that's where it may uh, give some useful analysis vis-a-vis -vis what happened from 1920 to 1929. So if you, if you think you understand what happened during the Roaring Twenties, you can then analyze what made that happen, uh, technology primarily. Um, and then you look at, is that same technological progress happening now? If so, uh, it's logical that there should be some correlated moves to the upside. Um, uh, let's look at this chart here. This is GDP from 1950 to 2016 by country. I thought it was an interesting stat or, or, or graph. Um, 
in green countries above that blue line had positive GDP growth and countries mm -hmm. below it were red. So you can see that about what 90% of countries in the world have had positive GDP growth since 1950. So the trend is up to the right on everything. Um, all these countries are growing. They're growing GDP, which means their technology makes your 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 production scalable, more uh, leverageable, and technology drives wealth. Okay, and so is that continuing? Yes. Is the trend accelerating? I would say it's even accelerating faster than what you would have seen at, at the beginning part of the 20th century. So these tend to um, rise at an accelerating pace, not a not even a, a same proportional amount. So um, population is also growing at an accelerating rate. So um, I don't know what the population was in 1900. It might have been a billion people. Let me just check Count. that. Population 1920, world population. Let's look at that. So in 1920, the world population was looks like 1.9 billion. We're currently at what 7.2 or something, and we're going to go to probably nine billion people in the world in uh, in the next 30 years. So you're seeing technology rising exponentially, population rising significantly, GDP rising significantly, and um, you know when you talk about technology, um, we have gone through a golden age, right? So the internet, obviously, uh, manufacturing, uh, medical science, uh, and the breakthroughs continue, right? We've got um, artificial intelligence, we have, uh, they're, match the, you know, the, they're mapping the human genome. It, so in a way, we're going through uh, robotics. Uh, so we're going through a golden age, as we speak, of breakthroughs that were not foreseeable, like, Driverless cars was a fantasy 20 years ago, okay? Um, mapping, right. Uh, so a lot of these things, I mean, the idea of a smartphone, inconceivable. Um, the idea of the internet was inconceivable. And even when the internet was obviously invented, things like YouTube were not foreseen, right? The idea that anyone could get access to any information, you know, a world library on YouTube. Um, so we're exceeding the highest predictions of what was possible conceived of possibly in 1960 or 1970, or like you said, even 1990. Um, therefore, a lot of these trends would not tell me anything specifically about the period 2022 to 2030. Um, we may even have some dips, right? We're going to have problems with inflation. There could be another world war, who knows? Mm -hmm. But over, over, let's say, the medium term, it's clear we're going to exceed what happened in the roaring 20s. Uh, we could do a tenfold of something like that in terms of wealth, wealth, uh, well-being, um, and growth. Um, but who knows? But uh, yes, so absolutely, uh, setting a time frame for 2030 uh, is very hard. Um, but the trend is your friend, as they say, and it looks like all of these metrics are are moving up the curve very rapidly. So I hope I I, I provided so, a useful short uh, analysis there. So yes or no question. A yes or yes or no answer. <laughs> this is re very recent data. It's showing that we're probably going to see a bit of a slowdown on real GDP mm -hmm. um, next year. This is from, or rather, yes, this, this year. year coming up soon. So we're seeing a slowdown. This could be two years. This could be three years. It could go to 2025. Um, after that, you'll probably see an acceleration of growth from 2025 to 2030. Does that compare to uh what's going to happen in the roaring 20s um it seems like it's more like a one hump two so whereas the the, the roaring 20s was maybe more of a straight curve up this might have a little bit of a bump into it and then perhaps reach the same target yeah so i would say yes if it's a yes okay, no so i, I would yes. say right i mean with the caveat that you just need to what, what, by what measurement right i don't see um a bearish view of the world of course uh Black Swan events, uh, World War III. Um, well, World War III disaster. would be game over for the, all the superpowers. So then that would be all destroyed. Yeah. And so that's always the case. The population. You, have to, you can't price that in. You can't look at that. So uh, taking away those long tail risks, those Black Swan events, uh, the answer is yes.
Okay. So the answer is yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was fun, right? So uh, now I will take a little bit of the initiative and just talk about two altcoins very quickly. So uh, I spent some time talking about Lux on my channel over the past uh, weeks. Uh, I brought it to you as a gem because I'm following it for some time. I read it twice, read its uh, white paper and stuff. Uh, and I have uh, many reasons to believe that this is going to be L1, layer one. I'm not sure if you know, Curtis, about Luxo, anything about Luxo. I don't, I don't know anything. You know about the ERC-20 standard, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so the guy who created that standard, he is uh, creating his own uh, layer one for s quite some time, ever since he left Ethereum. Okay. So for years, and this this layer one that uh, is going to focus on the uh, digital identity, and they started working on it even before the metaverse became such a massive trend as it is becoming to be. So it's even aligns even better now because uh, digital identity is going to be essential in the metaverse on the blockchain, and also identity of all the, the digital items and. Even digital fashion as well. He has a colleague there, Marjorie, who is all into the uh, digital or, or into the fashion uh, stuff. But anyway, that uh, it they they are not on mainnet yet, so their token is ERC twenty for now still, and they are on a streak of a bad news. And uh, why? What I want to talk to you about? I want to bring you bearish perspective on, or or more bearish, still bullish, but a little bit more bearish perspective on Luxo on Ethereum contract. Uh, I made a video uh, a couple of days ago talking about Ethereum contract, uh, Luxo on Ethereum contract, and I am uh, bullish on this chart. But what I can be wrong is a time frame because what actually can be happening that this chart is quite bearish on the daily frame, daily time frame, but on weekly, I believe it's still going to be bullish. There are levels that I have drawn these yellow lines uh, for you because I think they work. I think this chart respects them. So what I told you in the video, what I told you that this level is going to happen before this level. Uh, right. And I meant it on daily and that's actually where I can be wrong. So I want to talk about the alternative in case I'm wrong here. Can because... you tell us what is the bad news? Was there bad news recently? The bad news was that the uh, uh, you know before mainnet there are lots of test uh, nets that you have to be uh, that layer one has to make lots of test nets yeah. and uh, uh, progress through them and you know catch all the bugs and uh, critical errors and all of that kind of stuff and implement more improvements and the last right. test net that is meant to be before the 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 mainnet release uh, to L16 it was in beta it was not even a public yet but it uh, it stopped they then they stopped it and they decided to restart it at the end of April so more delay more time just delays okay and that news was here that news was here and then before the first bad news was here so Luxo has not had very good news for the past six months now so uh, I think the chance is high that they will arrive because when you see a project, I know this has a solid background, solid development, everything. I know it. It's not just a matter of belief. I know. So I know this is going to play a major role in the future as a layer one. And after so right. much bad news, consequently, I think there is a pretty good chance. But uh, uh, on daily, uh, what I want to say that um, uh, the bearish alternative is that we actually now uh, reverse somewhere in this cluster. I don't think we are going to straight to this level, though. Right. I can be wrong given that, but I think that there can be there can be some kind of a reaction, then this level, then the reaction, and mm -hmm. then break out all the way to the 0 0.002 level. Right. Or or maybe if you, if you are really bearish on daily, then if you go there uh, immediately and then bounce back to where we are or where. But right. still, on weekly, I am still bullish. Uh, even if we come back, even if we somehow now through some sideways, even if we come back to this level, uh, 0 0.02, where we were right. last summer, I think that this chart is still bullish because it went up so much parabolic here. That's a long consolidation afterwards. I think it's uh, it's completely excusable. I would still say, even if this happens, that this chart is still bullish and I would still be uh, seeing it as the, the point of reversal then. 
and maybe another parabolic run because these parabolic runs on this contract as you can see they are not impossible and even right. not uncommon of course right. they're gonna become they're gonna be becoming less and less often right they're gonna be you know more and more time will have to pass after everyone mm. so that was just the bearish alternative for Lux on Ethereum contract. That's all I wanted to say. And the last thing I'm going to talk to you about is uh, Ripple. If I have a few minutes. Uh, so uh, Ripple, uh, uh, I'm sure all of you know that uh, there is a legal, uh, a legal battle going on with SEC. I'm sure Curtis knows. He yeah. follows SEC. He knows everything about SEC. Uh, so, um, there is a battle going on ever since like the beginning of 2021 and even 20, end of 2020. And I remember, oh my god, how people were absolutely like, oh, I've never seen so much fun about Ripple down here. I've never right. seen so much people leave Ripple. I've seen because at that point of time I followed Cardano, I was in Cardano community and there were so many posts about the beautiful grandma stories, how he left the Ripple and switched for Cardano and how he's happier. Right, now, right. And, and that is usually the point of the very bottom if that happens. So that is a very, very bullish sign. Right. Um, so I think this point is going to be like a very strong bottom. Uh, but um, uh, I think that in time they they will win, of course. Okay, let's say just if scenario, if Ripple will win the the the, the battle, and if it is if it is allowed to come back to the US exchanges, if that mm. happens, I think right. that on Bitcoin contract it has a very long, unbelievably long way to go. That's one thing right. that I have to say. Because right. you can see, like, it has a way to go. It has a right. very way go, to go. Yeah, there is potential there, yeah. And also on a uh, normal fiat contract, it never made a new all-time high. This is, uh, we have to uh, go to bitstamp chart. As you can see, full Ripple chart. It never made everything went to do new. The usage utility of Ripple has increased tremendously over the past uh, five years, four years. Ever since it was here, the utility of the toy token has increased tremendously. There are How new so? use cases even. How so? I don't follow it that closely, but there are lots of new strategic partnerships in Asian markets. Uh, even uh, ever since the the battle started going on, they were kicked from the U.S. exchanges. But there yeah. is more than I seen so many partnerships about uh, even in Japan. And also yeah. there are some NFT use cases as well. I don't follow right. Ripple that much, uh, but mm. uh, uh, I, never I can understood say... Actually, what was the val I always saw the partnerships. So one was with SBI Holdings in Japan. So because I'm in Japan, I heard about mm -hmm. that. But I never quite figured out what it was going to be used for other than international settlement. Mm -hmm. But I always thought that, that the banks were going to fight that. But I'd, I'd love to hear more, but I never really heard the use case for XRP. Or rather, it I heard it, I just fuel. didn't really get it. I know yeah. it's used as a fuel for some products. So, X-Rapid, I believe. X-Rapid, X. -rapid, X -A -A -P -D. I thought the big thing was there were going to be a settlement layer between banks, right? That was originally what it was going to be. Or is that stable coins now? It seems like stable coins have taken that up. Could be. But all I just know that when Ripple was here, it was the real value of Ripple was tremendously lower than it is right now, literal value. And we never even crossed this point. And there are all the other altcoins, major altcoins that all of them have, you know, made new all-time high, you know, Ethereum, you know, Cardano, yeah. everything. Yeah. Not not a Ripple. So that's yet another, like, it still is waiting for its new yeah. all-time high. That's all I'm right. saying. Yeah, gotcha. So, and that we have to wrap it up. Do you want to say anything to... No. No. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, I thought maybe for future we would maybe t can we talk about content for the next one? You can tease. You can tease people. You can tell uh -huh. them. <laughs> we'll talk about SEC's uh, criteria for determining something's a security because it would make a lot of alts uh, perhaps in trouble. Uh, in other words, not being able to be tradable 
on an, on a, an exchange if the exchange is registered with the SEC. So stay tuned for the next stay time. Tuned. As uh, Curtis is gonna dive into SCC, we will as well update everything and I will bring you some altcoin as well. So, see you again in two weeks. Thanks.